Hey there, Jarbs here. I'm gonna over explain a uh, teamfight tactics game. This is a game that I played yesterday morning, around 24 hours ago. I have not watched it back or anything. Uh, it was a really intense, fun game. I definitely made a lot of mistakes, but we don't have to talk about that now because we'll talk about it over presumably the next like two or three hours because I'm gonna play through this slowly and explain in a lot of detail what's going on, why I'm doing things, I'll be critical of past me and point out when I'm making mistakes, stuff like that. Uh, a tricky thing about Teamfight Tactics is it's a very complicated game, but it is played in real time with no ability to pause because it's multiplayer. So when I'm streaming it, there is limited ability for me to really stop and explain fully mechanics that deserve a full explanation. So by uh, looking through this with pause, I'm able to explain exactly what's going on. Um, carousel, recurve bow, generally accepted to be the best starting item right now. Uh, the reason that recurve bow is so good, in my opinion, this is actually going to be a like, three or four minute explanation probably. In this game you get probably 10, I don't know exactly, but I, my feeling is that you get maybe 10 to 12 component items uh, over the course of the game. By component item, I mean like recurve bow, whereas a completed item would be two recurve bows makes a rapid fire cannon. With those 10 to 12 items, generally items have sort of multiplicative effects. So it's better to make two characters really, really strong with three items each than it is to make six characters a little bit stronger with one item each. I don't think that rule always holds. For example, it can be really useful to just throw a tier onto one of your characters who you really need to ultimate. Um, somebody like Cho'Gath or Sejuani, just making sure their ultimate goes off before they die with a tier can be really valuable. But generally, that's something that I'm thinking about in games of Teamfight Tactics is uh, like which two or maybe three guys are getting a ton of items so that they'll be really strong so that we can win fights. And generally, one of the most important things for me to get out of my items is damage. It's very hard to deal a lot of damage in this game uh, just off like the base values for characters. There are a lot of problems with it. Uh, one, there just aren't many characters who deal a lot of damage with their base values. Um, if you're playing specifically an Assassin's comp, maybe you can get away with building tanky items, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think if you're building an Assassin's comp, you probably just build more offensive items. Um, you could try to have like six damage dealers, like you could try to go um, all in on rangers or whatever, and that's actually a fairly strong composition that people will build. But a problem with doing that is that if you have a big clump of characters who are built around doing damage, you need some way to make it so they don't just die to an AoE attack. Um, if you build like one or two really strong damage dealers out of items, you can like put them in a corner where they're safe. Or you can build a character who has a lot of base damage, like a Swain, for example, late in the game. And you can build him with one damage item, one armor item, and one MR item, and keep him alive that way, using all of your items to, to keep him going. So Recurve Bow is really good, basically, at doing that. It's really good at making one character who does a lot of damage. And generally, that feels like a really, really, really strong thing to be doing in this game, for all of the reasons I've just said, and, and maybe a bunch more uh, that I haven't. Almost certainly a bunch more that I haven't. So just looking at the carousel, finding the recurve bow and grabbing it. It's somewhat important to get a two cost unit. The reason that it is somewhat important to get a two cost unit is that until you are level three, you're not going to see any other two cost units at all, but you're going to see a bunch of one cost units. And so pretty much the first thing that I'm doing after round one is selling my two cost unit and buying one cost units. A lot of the early game is about getting three of a kind of the one cost units to get a two star one cost unit, or to get two two star one cost units maybe. That could be even better. And so if I have four of them after round one, 
when I look at my five one cost units that I'm offered at the end of or at the beginning of round two, at the end of round two, at the beginning of round three, there's more likelihood that those match one of the units that I have on my bench because I have four instead of two. If I had a Blitzcrank instead of a Cassidy and Darius right now, if I just went for two Mordekaisers and had a Cassidy and Darius, there's like I'm not going to get three of a kind of Blitzcrank. And so I'm just massively handicapping my ability to get a three of a kind of a one cost unit um, because I don't have as many one cost units to match. So that's why we're doing that. We're killing creeps. Um, when you kill creeps, it's a big deal whether or not you get items. I believe this was not a game where I got a lot of items. I have not found item RNG to actually be that crazy important in this game, but definitely it helps to get more rather than less. That's certainly true. So we get three of the kind Cassidy. We now have a big Cassidy and we have a big Mordekaiser. This I think is a good point to pause and, and talk about what this means going forward in our early game. Because I think this is... This is probably the space of time in a game of Team 5 Tactics where you're meant to be doing this thing that I'm about to describe. So I know that I have a Cassidy and Mord at 2 star. I have a Darius. He's fine. Whatever. I don't have any more gold, so I'm not going to be able to buy more stuff right now, but um, that stuff's going on. I need to work out what I'm going to be doing in the first rounds of PvP combat. If I want to win streak, I want to come close to guaranteeing that I can beat everybody on the board. Because win streaking is very valuable in this game. If you win three rounds in a row PvP, you start getting one extra gold. You get one extra gold just for winning uh, every single round. And then if you win three in a row, you get one extra gold. Six in a row, you get two extra gold every round. And nine in a row, you get three extra gold every round. So if I am able to spend some gold and guarantee that I'm winning against everybody in this uh, in this game for the early rounds, that will pay for itself pretty nicely. The other option is to hold on to my gold. If I hold on to my gold, I start generating interest on it. So I have 10 gold in the bank, that gets me one additional interest at the end of the round, and that goes all the way up to at 50 gold, I'm getting five additional interest. We can't get any more than that. I have to decide here how hard am I going to be going for the win streak bonus versus am I okay with just chilling out and going more for interest to generate my economy. And with a Kasten 2 and a Mordekaiser 2, like Mordekaiser's not an incredible piece or anything, but he's got a lot of health at this stage in the game. I'm just looking through the lobby and seeing that right now I feel like very confidently ahead of everybody except maybe that player with the pike um, middle 2 and a Kasten. And so I can, like, I can go for the win streak, seeing that. Um, I also have some idea of who the most threatening opponent is, so I can place my pieces to help me beat that opponent, because where my pieces are placed isn't going to really matter for the other ones. I'm going to beat them anyway. And I also got a chain vest out of the, uh, out of the creeps there, which means that I can build a phantom dancer on my Cassadin, and just go all the way for that. So looking through again, not seeing anybody who's a huge problem, and I go ahead and do that. I believe Kassadin was there for some specific reason about like, oh, against this person that's going to do that, or I put him there because of that reason. I don't remember what it was, though. One of the problems of watching this back is that I can't click around on the opponents as I want, so... Uh, Sometimes I'm not going to know the information that I had in the past because in the past it was like in my short-term memory or I could just click on it to get it. But I'll do my best. In general, if you can't get up to 10 gold, there's no reason not to be buying out units to try to hit pairs. I think that's simple enough, right? Or try to hit trips rather, not pairs. So this is an easy win. Another bonus of putting a Phantom Dancer on Cassidy is I do deal a little bit more damage to other players. And that actually does mean something. 
dealing one more damage to an opponent right now in the early rounds on stage 2-1, dealing one more damage, it doesn't do a lot. But it also doesn't do nothing. There are there are definitely games of teamfight tactics where a player wins with one health left, and if they'd taken one more damage, they would have been dead instead. So that is... It's one of the one of the small but real things that's going on as I'm uh, as I'm doing that. I felt like my win streak was a little bit threatened there, so I went ahead and leveled up and threw Illusion in. Just looking at the lobby, I felt like there was one person that I wasn't sure I could beat, and this you know guarantees that. And again, we're actually dealing a significant amount of damage to this opponent. Rooster is going from one hundred percent. To 91. So I just dealt 9% of that player's health in one round. Um, in games like this, you're not going to be able to just win streak through the entire game and, and like win the entire game. Do I want to explain this now? I'll, exp I'll talk about this now. So, at some point in the game, you start rolling for more units, right? And the thing about rolling is that the more different units that you want to buy, the more valuable a roll is. If there are like eight different units that I would be happy to buy a copy of, then rolling is incredible, because I'm just really lucky, really likely to get one of those. If there's only like one or two, then rolling's really not very good. And so in this game, because of how getting new units is structured with that rolling, it's very advantageous to build one comp that can get you through the game for a while and then stop spending money on units for a while. Generate a bunch of income, level up, buy some experience, and then get to a point where like, okay, now I'm higher level. Higher level means that I see... Um, four cost and five cost units, and all of a sudden those are units that I'm interested in rolling. I have more space in my team. I've been adding sort of crappy units to my team because I haven't actively been rolling to buy new units, and so I have a lot of units that I want to replace. And I have a lot of gold. I've got like 50 gold. And so you reach a place where all of a sudden your rerolls are very valuable, and you go all in there, and that's where you like build your next comp. And I think generally in these games... I will have like my early game and my late game comps and there won't be there won't be three events where I do that but there will usually be two events where I like build one team then wait then build another team and uh, then at the end of the game it's like yeah often it gets down to a point where you're just rolling for one unit because there aren't many ways to improve your late game team but at that point that's the best you can do unfortunately <clears throat> so with all that said that space between building your first team and building your second team, how much gold you can bank and how much more experience you can get and how long you can wait is dependent on how much health you have and how strong your first team is. So what I'm doing right now here is I'm protecting my health, I'm making it so that my first team is quite strong, and I'm hurting other players and their ability to protect their health and punishing them for not having a strong first team yet. Because what a lot of other players are doing at this point in the game is they are sitting there banking gold right now. They're making a first team out of just the units that they were offered by chance. They're not bothering to level up. And they're waiting to make their uh, their like first investment for later in the game, maybe... Uh, after the golems creep round is a pretty normal time to do that or something like that. I think a lot of people who are playing this game are like just chilling out and then they're going all in on a comp after one of the creep rounds and they're never doing that in between thing where like they make one team and then they wait and then they make a second team. And I think that's something that's actually like very powerful and something that you could Think about adding to your game if you're not thinking about it at all. All right. So we're beating up another person. I managed to get a two-star Lucian, which is 
you know, pretty lucky. And my team's relatively strong at this point in the game. Note that I didn't get a ton of items. I didn't get incredible synergy bonuses or anything. I just did the things that were available, gave myself the most chances of hitting trips, made an item out of the um, two components that I did get, and now I'm win streak bonusing. So, cool. Um, second carousel, we're thinking about what sort of items we want to make later in the game. This is really hard to do. Generally, I like items which deal damage. Uh, generally, I like needlessly large rods, I like BF swords, I like recurve bows, obviously those are incredible. And uh, I like Tear of the Goddess because it makes it so your ultimate goes off faster if you're uh, using an ultimate to deal damage. Or to crowd control. Tear of the Goddess is really good for crowd controlling, unlike your Cho'Gaths and Sejuani's later on in the game as well. I wonder if I'm gonna like over explain everything right at the start of the lobby and then have nothing left to explain. Because the game has a lot of stuff in it, but it has like at some point you have sort of explained it all. Um There's some point after a few hours where you've like said all of the grand strategy things that there are about this game and it becomes about execution and, and tiny things. I believe I just leveled up and threw a Shannon, yeah? So I took a Shen with a needlessly large rod at the carousel, then I leveled up and put Shen in the team. I guess I was looking through the lobby, I was feeling like my win streak was a little bit threatened, and I was like, I don't need to lose my win streak right now. Like, the, the difference between leveling up and not leveling up is not enough interest to be justifying losing my win streak at the moment. And we're... Carrying a decent bench over here. So, three, six, I have nine gold worth of units on my bench. The units that you have on your bench um, are greatly enhancing the value of seeing new units, uh, new cards uh, between rounds. Because if I have two Garens on my bench, then hitting this Garen is extremely valuable. If I have zero Garens on this bench, nobody cares. Like. That's great, but it doesn't do anything. So in order to maximize the value of your cards that you're seeing, you want to be having lots of units on your bench. However, in order to maximize your economy, you want to be gaining interest. And that's an, uh, a decision point that you're going to have to make a lot of judgment calls on in this game. That's not something I think that anybody has solved or anything like that. Like exact, There's no calculator that you can use for it. You have to regularly decide, though, do I want to sell units to generate interest, or do I want to hold them on my bench to increase the chance of hitting trips um, later on? It doesn't look like there's particularly much for me to be doing here. I'm just looking at other players. Sure, somebody's going assassins. That's a really good thing to note. I think two players were going assassins. I already have a phantom dancer, so like assassins shouldn't be too big a deal in this game. Decided to go for four knights, which is pretty sick. The knight bonus is very bad late game, but sick. Like it's it's decent early in the game. I won't say it's incredible, but it's it's quite good early in the game. It's helping me a lot to win these easily. What's my mortar kaiser getting hit for? Like nothing. Yeah. So, I said that I maybe get five or six completed items in a game. I'm not sure if that number is exactly right. Maybe it's more like six or seven, but you get some number of completed items in a game. And building useful completed items, like good completed items for late game, is often a significant difference between like placing third and placing first. It's not always the biggest deal in terms of like whether you place eighth or fourth. But you eventually reach a point where you're in late game situations where having items that do broken things is going to make you win against people who don't have items that do broken things. And Phantom Dancer makes you dodge all crits, and that is a broken thing to do against assassin compositions. So had I not been able to make an item that did something quite as strong, maybe I wouldn't have like being here to begin with. Maybe I never would have even gone for this win streak bonus and I would have been at like 80 health right now and I would have had more gold but less stuff on the board and we'd be playing a very different game. 
But my judgment call there was that Phantom Dancer was very likely to be a useful item later in the game, so I went ahead and built it. And sure enough, it looks like there are a couple of people who are building assassins in this game, and Phantom Dancer is great against them. It's not like it's terrible against uh, other people either, but it's really, really good against assassins. So we're killing the golems pretty easily. Um, after the golem round... Let's pause for a sec. Uh, I have bought experience twice in this game. People who haven't bought experience yet are going to be level 4 next round, and then level 5 the round after. So we're about to hit a point where I'm at experience parity with the rest of the lobby, and my units are not that strong. So we're about to enter a zone where it's definitely possible for me to be losing my win streak, and that's sort of okay. Um, we've reached a point, an inflection point, where it's no longer really worth it to be keeping 99 plus percent chance of winning against every opponent in the lobby. I haven't rolled enough really cool things. Um, you know, that's okay. Unless I level here. Actually, <laughs> I think leveling here and putting in like Kindred and... Hmm. Do I level here? Yeah, I do. Okay, never mind. That thing that I said was, was not true. Yeah, I think putting Kindred in there is pretty sweet. Okay, so what does that do? I do that because I hit Garen? I don't know. That's a really interesting spot, though. Um, level 6 is where you start seeing a noticeable number of tier 4 units uh, in your cards. So by going to level 6 here, yeah, I lose interest, but I reduce the number of rerolls that I need to make over the course of the game, because when I see cards uh, at the end of this round, they're going to be a level 6 roll instead of a level 5 roll. And the level 6 rolls of cards are more valuable than the level 5 rolls of cards. So let's take a look at whether I actually hit anything. No, I didn't. But, <laughs> um, well, I hit another Cassidy too. The, the point is that a lot of this game is about like maximizing the number of times that you can look for really good tier four plus units in order to make your late game comp with, right? One way to do that is to generate a ton of interest and have 50 gold when you hit level 6, so that you can reroll a lot. But a different way to do it, which sometimes you get to do, is to win streak to get a good amount of gold, and hit level 6 earlier than the other people. And so this opponent has a bit more gold banked than me, sure, but this opponent's only level 5, which means that at the start of the round I got a level 6 piece roll, and my opponent did not. Also, my opponent's taking uh, a lot more damage. So I'm also doing the thing where I'm beating people up in the lobby. Looks like I sold one of my Volibear pairs there. I don't think I'm very likely to be running a Volibear in this game, and I wanted the interest. That's just, again, one of those like choices that you have to make. So this time I got a Leona. Leona plus Braum gives you Guardian bonus, and that can be really strong. Uh, early on in the game. I also put in a Morgana. I'm going for demon bonus? Okay, sure. <laughs> I don't know, I'm doing something. So, I... I don't get that Leona, probably, if I'm level 5 still. But here I am with a Leona. Leona Braum, if you can hit it early, is a very, very... It's actually... A, pretty strong thing to have late in the game. It gives you a lot of armor on all of the pieces who are near Leona and Braum. And so having access to that gives me a like bridge point to keep me alive and working through this game. And I sold some pieces there. I grabbed an Ash because I think that it's more likely that I end up wanting an Ash than that I want a tier 2 Lucian or whatever. And I want to start generating income. I want to sort of rest on my laurels here. I've built a pretty strong early game team and I want to generate some income now and uh, be able to spend a lot of gold at some point to upgrade my current team into a late game team. 
Start so the carousel again. I haven't really been paying that much attention to item specifics. I'm not in the game. I'm talking more about like the abstract stuff that's going on and, and that's just how this is going to be. But I guess I decided I wanted a needlessly large run. I think I'm building a death cap maybe. And the reason for that is that I have a Morgana. I'm thinking like Morgana can have a death cap and ultimate and then maybe I can upgrade her to a brand or a, an Aurelian Sol or something later on in the run. Sure, I mean, <laughs> that's probably what's going on. Oh, also <laughs> the needlessly large rods on a Sejuani. Oh, that's actually a really big deal that I missed there. So when you're at the carousel, there, there are two things that are going on. And I've been talking almost exclusively about items so far at the carousel. And the first carousel item is really just about the only thing that matters. Uh, getting a two-cost piece is a lot better than getting a one-cost piece at the first carousel, but you're, you're heavily, heavily, heavily caring about the item. It doesn't matter at all which two-cost piece it is. By the time you're at the second, third, fourth carousels, the piece actually can be a pretty big deal. You definitely, you are usually going to care more about the item over the long term than you're going to care about the piece. But quite often, items don't do anything short term for you. Like quite often you'll be at a carousel and the items you're being offered don't actually build into anything particularly good. And in that situation, like... I don't know. You can put the item, like the component, on one of the pieces that you're planning to sell later so you can get it back and build into the item that you actually want in late game, but it may not do very much. Here I'm looking at the carousel and it's like, okay, so there are like three different items by the time I get to choose or whatever, and they're all like uh, equivalently irrelevant right now maybe. But the pieces I'm choosing between are Rek'Sai, who is like unplayable, Mordekaiser, who does literally nothing right now, and Sejuani, who is one of the best pieces in the entire game, with one of the uh, game's strongest ultimates. Sejuani is one of the pieces that is a reason why you build two damage dealers and then a bunch of different tanks. Because being able to put Sejuani and Cho'Gath onto the battlefield and have them survive long enough to ultimate without having to stack them with items like just breaks the late game. When people are playing eight or nine pieces and you have Sejuani and Cho'Gath ults going off, those ultimates are insane because of the AoE crowd control that they provide. And so yeah, um, that carousel pick wasn't actually so much about the needs to our draw, it was largely about getting a Sejuani into the team right now because I think that's going to keep my team pretty strong. This is a game where I'm likely to be able to win. Hmm. What does winning mean? It's weird, right? Because like the game says that you win for first, second, or third, so whether you're trying to get first or whether you're happy with getting third is sort of up to you a little bit. But this is a game that I'm likely to be able to do very, very, very well in, even if I get poor RNG on items for the rest of the game. And so... Um, watching Morgana go off with this rod. Um, because of that, I can definitely be making decisions about like what makes me stronger right now, what puts me in a better position for later, even if the item doesn't necessarily build into exactly what I want. Although needlessly large rod, I'm sure I'll find something useful to do with it later. Sejuani at the moment is, is very, very good. Here again, I'm level 6 while I'm econing up, and that means even though I'm not re-rolling, I'm seeing some really good pieces. So I'm getting offered a second Leona, or a first Nar. Nar is a very, very strong piece. Leona 2 would be very, very strong. Did I just level? Oh my, Steven, you zesty creature. So... <laughs> I've decided that Leona is strong enough to be worth throwing into the team right now. I've decided that I want to keep my win streak going, and I've decided that it's okay to be losing interest to do that, and I get to start seeing level 7 pieces now. Sick. I think I might actually lose this, though. I don't know. We got this. 
I have a significant win streak bonus, right? So if I can make myself win a round instead of losing a round by hitting that level up, it starts to pay for itself pretty quickly. Just buy a Volibear and lose interest? What am I doing? I'm thinking that Glacial is a likely place that I might go. Okay, that makes sense. I do have a Lissandra, Fala Bear, and two Ashes, so that's not not unreasonable at all. Working out this transition phase where I'm going from having a bunch of strong one-cost units with the motley assortment of other things and trying to aim toward having a bunch of very strong late-game units or alternately a very strong synergistic package of units. Um, it's very difficult to work out which things you're meant to be buying as you go through this stage of the game, exactly. The first, like, hundreds of times that you are sitting there with 60 gold and a team that's, you know, all right, you're going to do a very bad job of working out how to spend that 60 gold to make your team better, exactly. You may have some idea of what to do, but you're not going to do it close to perfectly. And I'm definitely still in the place where I'm like making a lot of mistakes as I try to transition this team composition into the next team composition. Um, yeah, one of the one of the problems is bench space. So if I don't know what I'm building next, I have to hold a lot of different pieces to try to be able to build whatever I want later in the game. I think putting the BF sword on Varus would be fine here. Mm, Sichuani freaked out at the start of this fight. That's my fault. She's positioned incorrectly, and because of that, she didn't go off at the start of the fight. I, yeah, that is going to end up losing me the fight. And so that's the end of my win streak bonus, unfortunately. I wonder if, um, I wonder if BF Sword on Varus is enough to win this. I think it is. So I think I just punted that win streak, probably. But that's okay. Um, we got a lot out of our win streak. We're in a pretty good place. And now that we don't have the win streak bonus, there's much less reason to care about like leveling up super early or um, throwing in pieces that are good right now but expensive to grab or whatever. Now all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're at 95 health. Like I said earlier, you're going to spend health in order to build your economy in this game, and so having 95 health at this point in the game, stage 4-2, is like, great. I am so capable of just chilling out and spending health to uh, get stronger and build my late game composition, and that's what I'm intending to do. I don't think this Morgana placement is very good. Um, maybe it won't matter. This ultimate is not going to be good. Nice try, though, Morgana. Morgana's a weird piece. Um... If you can get her to ultimate on the front line, she's great, but she's pretty squishy, so it's pretty hard for her to actually survive long enough on the front line to get an ultimate off, unfortunately. We're losing again. It doesn't, like, I'm not going to try to lose streak here. Lose streaking is another way that you can generate extra income per round, but the problem with lose streaking is that you take a bunch of damage and you deny yourself the chance to win one extra gold for your win bonus uh, in any of the rounds. So win streaking is great. You get one extra gold for each win, you get you know up to three extra gold for your win streak and you take no damage. Lose streaking is something where like, okay, if it happens, um, it's nice that you're getting extra gold, but it's probably not a thing that you want to heavily aim at in the mid stages of the game. Because the guarantee that I can lose against the weakest player in this lobby requires me guaranteeing taking like 15% health damage against the strongest player in the lobby if I get paired against them. And I don't know who I'm going to get paired against, right? Aurelian Soul just fucking blew this fight up. That is a scary Aurelian Soul with a Rage Blade and a... <sighs> Shinju? Is that what that's called? <laughs> um on it already. I've played like three, no, I've played way more than 3,000 hours of League, but I played it like three plus years ago, so some of the items are new to me. Yeah, if you don't know me, if you're like watching this video having not seen my other content, I make a lot of content about like deck builders and other strategy games, and this is just the latest one that I've been playing. 
most recently I've been playing a lot of Slay the Spire. The last like year and a half I am considered one of the better Slay the Spire players in the world. So uh, at this carousel we got some recurve bow taken, recurve bows taken, somebody took a spatula, we got a naked, uh, blah, 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 blah. we got this, a Yomu's, a Yomu's Nidalee, so Yomu's makes one of your units an assassin, maybe this player is like playing an assassin comp and has a draven and wants a draven to have plus crit damage, that can be pretty sweet, but this is an item that's hard to make great use of, so even though it's a completed item on the carousel, it's not that surprising that it went a little bit late. It looks like everybody was sort of picking the item that they wanted, and nobody picked Swain. <laughs> and, and this piece is one of the most insane pieces in the game. And I think... I can't say for sure. I'm not currently controlling the other players' teams and stuff. I don't know exactly where everybody is at in this game. But I suspect that at least one of the players in this lobby made a mistake by not taking Swain. And, like, the reason is that they're looking at the item and seeing that it's a chain vest and being like, oh, I don't really need the chain vest. But it's also a fucking Swain. Um, <laughs> chain vest is a good item to have on Swain. Like, you, you're pretty happy to have a tanky Swain. So, grabbing Swain here uh, lets my comp, even though I'm not really spending money, all of a sudden have a late game carry in it. Just out of nowhere. And I can start thinking about how I'm going to build my Swain to be super strong. And I can also start thinking about how I'm going to get a tier 2 Swain. Because, you know, that's likely to just straight up win the game. Um, to get a tier 2 Swain, I probably want to level to 7. Well, level to 8, because I'm currently 7. And start rolling tier 5 units. And probably I'm strong enough to actually do that. I don't think I ended up with quite the right team there. I grabbed a Draven for the Imperial bonus. Um, Draven plus Swain work pretty well together. But I haven't put items on everybody yet, um, and I get absolutely murdered by assassins in this round, unfortunately. Um, yeah, my team isn't built right, uh, my positioning is wrong. There's just like too much stuff to do at once in these middle rounds. And I think recognizing your limitations as a human being with only so much ability to click on stuff quickly and work things out is important. You can very reasonably do things like roll down the round before when you have 50 gold. Like instead of waiting to get your extra 2 gold of interest, you can absolutely justify rolling 20 of that gold the previous round because you just know that you don't have time to make every decision right otherwise. Trying to work out who my Sejuani goes in over. And <laughs> struggling a lot to work that out, apparently. I've only been playing this game for uh, like four days or something. So I understand a lot of the general concepts because I have played a trillion deck builders at a high level in my life. But um, the unit specific sort of stuff that's going on in this game can be really tough for me sometimes. So we got murdered again. I think this player has one of the stronger teams in the lobby. So we've got him paired against two teams that murdered us. Our team's not necessarily terrible, but it did very badly against those two opponents. That's for sure. And am I leveling or rolling here? I th there are so many really good rolls for me. And we're got a Phantom Dancer goes on Swain or Draven against the Assassins. I should wait until I see what items I get from the creeps. I didn't. <laughs> I should definitely wait until I see what items I get from the creeps there to decide like who my actual unit that isn't going to die to Assassins is meant to be. Got a Rage Blade for Paris or Swain. I'm confused now. See, I think when I pick up the Rage Blade, now all of a sudden I want the Phantom Dancer to be on Draven, so I think I made that play wrong. And I have 78 gold, so I'm going to level, and then I'm going to start making sure that this team can actually stand up to late game comps. I still have a Mordekaiser and a Tier 1 Kindred in this team. Those are just not units that I want late in the game. I've got a Tier 1 Sejuani who needs to be upgraded. I've got a Tier 1 Braum, and it's unclear whether I'm going to keep that forever or um, upgrade it. 
Is that for a demon bonus? Hot. All right, cool. <laughs> I don't know. We're like, we're doing something, but the general idea there was that I leveled and put in a unit that gave me a synergy bonus, and now we're going to um, start rolling pretty soon. I get paired against Aurelian Soul again, and every single one of my units lines up for the Aurelian Soul ult, and I go to 12% health here. And that's really rough. Um, it's looked for the last three rounds like my comp is getting absolutely stomped, but I think that's heavily because I've been paired against players who stomp my comp three times in a row. And sometimes that happens, and that's forcing me to get a little bit more desperate than I would have to otherwise to get my team rolling. But fortunately I am level 8 and I have 54 gold, and so now it's time to do that. I think I just took a second there to think about what exactly I want to hit, and then we're starting to roll. Um, the answer of what exactly I want to hit is it's really complicated. <laughs> not, not sure. <laughs> could say for sure. So we've got three carries in this team. We've got a Sejuani. We just hit Sej 2. Sejuani is a very, very, very powerful unit. I gave her a Morale Nomicon. That's a decent item to put on her because her AoE ultimate will hit a ton of things when we cast it. I have a Swain. Swain is going to be very, very good against Assassins. So this is the fight where Swain's meant to be really good. And there he goes. We gave him a Phantom Dancer so that he cannot be crit. And um, we gave him a chain vest as well. So against the physical damage dealing assassins, that is the way that our comp is beating them. Notice that I'm talking very heavily about how my comp beats the things it has to beat. And I'm not talking a lot about exactly which synergy bonuses my comp has or anything like that. The stuff on the left side of the screen where the game like force feeds you UI elements to try to tell you what's important. It's not always as important as the stuff that's more hidden in the lobby, like exactly what other players are doing sort of thing. I have a 2 out of 3 on Shapeshifter right now. Hitting another Shapeshifter would be really good. And I guess I decided I didn't want another Sejuani 1 and wasn't going to go for a Sej 2 because I haven't been taking Sejuani. Maybe the thing is I just like need space to roll other stuff right now. So here we didn't fight against one of the strongest people in the lobby, and instead of taking a truckload of damage, we just killed him, which is nice. I'm first on the carousel here. Let's look at the carousel and I'll try to predict what I'm going to do. I'm going to take Draven with a recurve bow. Is that true? Um... The things that we need in this game, we need to hit 2-star Swain. That would be really nice. I think Draven needs to deal a little bit more damage. I don't remember if we hit 2-star Draven or not. I don't think we've hit 2-star Draven yet. So yeah, we're just taking the Draven. That's what we're doing. We have two copies of 1-star Draven. We're just taking the Draven for the piece again. This actually builds a pretty bad item on Draven. Uh, Recurve Bow plus BF. Because Draven's carrying an... Uh, a BF component, which hasn't been combined into anything yet, and when I take this Draven, it's going to automatically combine all of my Dravens. Um, yeah, we're gonna get... I think it's Execution is Calling, is that what this item's called? I don't know. 5% chance each second to gain 100% crit is the item description. And we can watch and see if that goes off or not, and maybe it swings a fight somewhere, I don't know. But it's not an item that I will generally build, just because it is very inconsistent. It's not an item that's going to guarantee you any wins, that's for sure. In fact, it's going to lose you some fights that you would have won with a different item that gave a bonus that, you know, wasn't so reliant on RNG on whether or not it's going to show up. One thing that you can do as you're rolling is you can buy out the pieces that you don't want to make it so the next roll has a higher chance of having the pieces that you do want in it. That's something that I haven't been doing, but like I could be buying this Anivia right now. The way that the game generates pieces is it decides what, um, what cost piece it's going to generate, and then it just picks from all of the pieces that are left in the pool. It just picks one of them. And so for tier 5 pieces, for example, there are 10 of each tier 5 piece. If I take one of those Anivias out of the pool, that's, you know, now there are only nine Anivias. And so when it's choosing one of the tier five pieces, the five cost pieces, 
it's uh, significantly more likely to be a swain. <laughs> significantly might be the wrong word. It is somewhat more likely to be a swain. And uh, giving yourself slightly more chance of getting the thing you want is one of the ways that you win in this game. So I'm not rolling at the moment. Oh, I am rolling at the moment. I got Kindred. I should be looking for a Shapeshifter, and I should be looking for my third Swain. But I think when I hit Draven 2 and I have the Swain with the Phantom Dancer, I think I started to chill out a bit on like, oh my god, I'm going to die really soon sort of stuff. Because all of a sudden this comp can beat the Assassins in the lobby. I wonder what happens if I fight against Aurelian Soul right now. Presumably I just die. Like I might actually get killed in one fight if I get paired against Aurelian Soul. So in endgame situations, we're down to only three players left in the lobby now. Oof. Well that's hot. Um in endgame situations, I think you are commonly going to be in spots where you don't clearly win. And it's just like sort of a little bit based on chance. Um, who do you get paired against? Do your opponents get paired against each other to knock each other out quickly? Does your opponent who you can't beat lose to the opponent who you can beat? And then all of a sudden you beat the opponent who you can beat. Stuff like that is definitely going on in late game situations. And uh, here we're just trying to get the comps that we can beat. Hoping that the players who we can't beat are knocked out. The thing that my comp cannot do very well is beat things which deal magic damage. And so Blueberry Jam has the giant Aurelian Soul. We're not in great shape against that team. Rooster has the Assassin comp. We murder that team. So we're hoping that we do not get paired against Giant Aurelian Soul, and I was actually looking at how Giant Aurelian Soul was placed and thinking, okay, I can like position to be best set up for that fight. And then I didn't change anything for some reason, I'm not really sure why. Also, why do I have a brand on the board? It's a bit of a mystery to me too. This was my first game of the day, so I'm pretty sure that I like roll past a gazillion Brahms. Um, there are definitely a lot of like positioning mistakes and all sorts of careless things later on in the game. It was not my best effort, but it turns out that tier two Swain is uh, completely insane, so that's cool. Um, I think the assassin comp is just like completely dead to me, although. The team has two Dragon Claws on it, I just noticed. So maybe we do need Draven to survive. I built a Locket of the Iron Solari just because um, there wasn't much reason not to. And this opponent's like playing pretty well. Cho'Gath is being used to take um, Draven out of the combat for the first five seconds with Zephyr. And then my opponent has two Dragon's Claws to deal with the Aurelian Soul in the lobby and stuff. My Swain just exploded, but um, fortunately Draven didn't get touched. Working out how to protect your Draven in a composition like this so the Assassins don't jump on it on turn one is a pretty big deal. And as you play against better and better players, they're going to be more and more clever about how exactly they can position their pieces to get to that Draven. There are some pieces who can really change the math on that too, like a Blitzcrank can just grab your Draven super early. Um, a Nar ult will often displace Draven enough, even if he starts in a corner, that he can get surrounded and killed. I'm fighting the same fight. So it would be a good idea for me to be looking at what my opponents are doing right now and making sure that they're not putting a Blitzcrank to kill my Draven uh, right before the round starts, because... Uh, you know, that's uh, sort of a big deal if they do that. I'm fighting against this player's clone. Mechanically how this works is when there are an odd number of players in the game, I need 
like the third player needs somebody to fight against. And so it clones one of the other two players' armies for them. The clone army can kill me, but I can't deal damage to the other player. So I beat that army really badly, I think badly enough that I would have knocked the player out. But it didn't actually do anything there, unfortunately. I guess old Steven has no idea what he's meant to be doing right now, and uh, current Steven certainly isn't in tune with exactly what items are going on and stuff to work it out, but we're making another carousel decision. We're trying to work out if any of the pieces are very important, and if any of the items are particularly important. I grabbed uh, another Phantom Dancer. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's innately sensible. Seems very reasonable. So... I now have Phantom Dancer on Swain 2 and Draven 2. The Assassins should not be a problem, and it's just do I beat Aurelian Soul or not? I think rolling here is just dumb. I think I should just be looking at the Aurelian Soul comp and uh, positioning my pieces to be in the best possible place against that composition. I uh, should be able to kill the Assassin player here. I still don't really know why there's a brand in my team. With a demon bonus? I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure on that. Well, now it's a brand too. Cool. It's just like, it's a zero item brand. It's dealing like mostly insignificant damage. We're rolling down for Braum 2, which I think I've skipped like 17 times so far in the lobby. If this is your first exposure to Teamfight Tactics, I am definitely thinking about adding more Teamfight Tactics content to my YouTube channel. Um, maybe exporting games that I think were really interesting. Ah, see that time I checked to see if my opponent had Blitzcrank, saw that he did, and then the Blitzcrank grabbed Cho'Gath. That's why I moved the Draven. And Draven wasn't in the Aurelian Soul ult. Well, that was actually pretty damn good for me. Uh, Draven's a strong piece, as you can see. So I lose that, by, n but not by enough to die. Uh, yeah, the channel on YouTube definitely has daily Slay the Spire uploads, and those are definitely going to continue forever. I'm just thinking about, like, I could add maybe twice a week some Teamfight Tactics content. I don't know if I'm going to play enough of this game for it to be daily or anything. This is the first time that I ever fought Elder Dragon. And I just sort of assumed that my team was really good and would win. Uh, which was certainly an assumption to make. <laughs> you can check out how that goes for me. There are, I believe, 13 of each tier 4 piece. So you might have noticed that I'm, like, never trying to hit a uh, three-star Draven or a three-star Leona or a three-star Cho'Gath or Sejuani or whatever. It's just really hard to do that. Is why. Yeah, if Draven just deploys in the left corner so that he doesn't die to the dragon there, we would have been fine. But, uh, yeah, I do die to the dragon. It deals me four damage. My opponent got a red buff. I could have gotten an entire completed item too, but I lost the fight. Whoops. And now the only thing left is to work out how we're beating our opponent. So I'm rolling for Blitzcrank specifically here. I just rolled past two Brahms, lol. Uh, <laughs> I'm rolling for Blitzcrank here. Uh, Aurelian Souls actually defended, so it doesn't even work. And I'm trying to just position so that Blitzcrank's going to hook a Sejuani in his face. and Hoping that we can win from here. This fight's epic. Leona ults Aurelian Soul while Aurelian Soul's at full mana. Which was insane. And by the time that Aurelian Soul ultimates... Nothing is happening. Draven is at 1 HP, which is enough to kill my opponent. And, uh, <laughs> and we, win the, we win the game. Anyway, I thought that was a really fun ending. Uh, sort of a hilarious game. Lots of very obvious mistakes that I made, but I think the general idea of what I was doing is like pretty sensible and sound. 
I think you saw the strategy executed very poorly, but it still managed to win a lobby full of players who are somewhat competent at the game. Um, this game doesn't have ranked mode yet, but uh, Riot does do like MMR matchmaking rating, matchmaking rating is that what? Yeah, or ELU based uh, matchmaking, and it has a like hidden rating for you. So I've won a good number of teamfight tactics games over the last few days, and I'm at a point where I'm getting paired with fairly reasonable players. I was getting paired with Hafu um, a couple of days ago when we were queuing up at the same time, so definitely my account has a rating that's high enough that I'm playing against competent players, and we were able to win doing that. So that's pretty sweet. The composition is not something that you would probably like read about in a guide video. Um, it's not like six nobles or six sorcerers or like knights rangers or whatever. It's a composition where I built my um, one cost stuff, held off on really committing to anything for a while, just made gradual improvements to the team, made some level ups, and then I just rolled for really strong uh, four and five cost units basically. and. That's why this composition was able to win. Um, I was able to leverage some of the mechanics of the game, leverage the way the economy works, leverage the advantage of rolling for um, rolling for lots of units at the same time. So being at level seven with a bunch of bad units and rolling is a lot better than being at level six with like half of your units already being good and rolling there because there are just a lot more units that I was able to hit while I was rolling, which would be improvements to the team. And yeah, again, I don't, I am under no illusion that I executed that flawlessly. I definitely did not, but it was enough for a win and I thought it was an interesting game and I hope you enjoyed hearing what I had to say about it. Alright, cool. Let me know if you enjoyed the video, and I may have some more content coming your way if you thought this was fun, and I'll see you next time.